Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome. Welcome back if you came to our winter tree ID workshop. Um, if you missed it, it's on the Forest School Association uh, YouTube channel. So check it out there. It is available to watch. But of course, we moved into spring now. As we're recording this, it's April the 19th. So um, some of the information for winter is still very relevant when we think about bark, um, tree form, you know, uh, leaf or bud arrangements. Uh, that sort of thing. So a lot of that is still relevant. There's some interesting tidbits there. But of course, everything is changing out in the woods. But uh, welcome, whether you're watching live or on YouTube. We've got people from all over the UK, Ireland and beyond, which is fantastic. So really nice to welcome everybody into the room. Um, uh, let's talk about what we're going to be doing tonight. This can last about an hour and, and uh, we're going to cover as much as we can. And uh, in terms of questions, if you'd like to put a question, pop it in the chat room, folks, and uh, I'll do my best to answer them as we go. And we might have time for Q&A at the end as well. We'll see what we can get in. But let's get straight into it. So I'm going to get my screen share up for you folks so you can see what's going on. OK, here's me. Identifying trees in springs. Of course, everything has changed in the woods now. Here's me, uh, our little boys and my wife, Lee. We run Woodland Classroom together in Northeast Wales um, in sunny Wrexham. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we've got a lovely uh, new woodland site that we're using, actually. Fantastic place called Park in the Past. Um, amazing place. And so really excited about that. Uh, the website's woodlandclassroom.com if you want to check out what we do. Uh, my particular specialism, for those that don't know me, um, is... Woodlands and trees, woodland management. So my background is environmental conservation. And then I came into forest school and then into bushcraft afterwards. So I trained in, in countryside management, doing, you know, uh, tree work, um, hedge laying, making ponds, fences, steps, footpath work, you know, bashing Himalayan balsam, all this kind of conservation work with groups. And my particular love has always been kind of trees and woodlands and woodland habitats. Then, of course, all the crafts and the wild food that come with it. Of course, identification is a big part of that. So that's been my specialism over the last uh, few years. Um, so let's talk about what we're going to learn tonight. So you're going to get a solid grounding in how to identify trees in spring when everything's changing. So we're going to be looking at particularly spring signs now. So blossom, young leaves, catkins and other signs. Um, I'm going to just briefly recap my three key principles of tree ID, which you can apply to any species. I talked about that in the winter webinar. So if you want more details on that, watch that. So I'm not repeating myself too much, but we'll go briefly over it. We're going to cover around 10 common tree species, but I think a lot more will be touched on. We're going to talk about the spring tree calendar. So not just what to look for, but when to look for it. And that's really important because there's certain signs of early spring, signs of mid spring and signs of late spring as well. And knowing when to look for things really helps you kind of eliminate what you're looking at. So that's really useful to know. Uh, we're going to look at catkins on male and female trees. Um, we're going to look at a few tiny but beautiful tree flowers, ones you might not have noticed before. And we are also going to look at, oh, that's a misspelling, wild cherry versus bird cherry, that should say. Two cherry trees, what's the difference? And we're going to have a look at that. Um, and then there's a quiz. So have pen and paper ready for near the end. We're going to do a quiz and you can write down your answers and then see how you did. And that'll be recapping a lot of the stuff that we've been learning today. And then if we've got time, we'll take some questions. And I've also got some resources to share with you about how you can take your tree learning to the next level, because I've got an online tree ID course and there might be some of my students in tonight. So if there are, do say hello, which would be great. Let's get straight into it. So everything changes in spring. And I've uh, been taking a lot of photos over the last few years of these details of trees. Um, some of these unknown, you know, lesser known flowers, I should say. A lot of us know the elderflower. But do we know the flower of the oak tree, for instance? You know, there's some interesting little signs to look out for and get us looking deeper at what's going on um, around us. And there's some nice examples there, some of the variety you get in springtime. Um, let's just check. So in terms of the UK, we have around kind of 32 to 50 native naturalized tree species, depending on which book you read. Um, that's not a lot in the grand scheme of things. There's a lot more on the continent, uh, but it's enough for us to be getting our teeth into for now and certainly enough to be teaching our young people at this stage. Um, and so we're going to be focusing on those native and naturalized species, um, really, rather than any kind of garden cultivars and that sort of thing. As I said, if you've got a question, pop it in the chat room and I'll see if I can get to it as we go. Oh, there's six people in the waiting room. Am I still letting people in? There we go. Okay, 
Whoops. Okay, so firstly, three hacks for tree ID or my three key principles. I talked about this in winter. Let's go briefly over them again. Hopefully some of you guys that were here last time remember them. Number one, this is tuning in. Very important, tuning into your environment. Number two, we always begin with a branch. Number three, we ask a question of the tree. Is it alternate or opposite? I'll explain what those means uh, very um, quickly. Uh, tune into your surroundings. Principle number one. Um, basically, don't just look at the detail of the little twig that you're looking at. Open up your view. Practice those owl eyes for those that have done animal senses and take in the bigger picture. What's going on around you? Is there a river really close by? Is that telling you that it's wet ground and possibly you're looking at something like willow or alder? Are you in the uplands? And that's telling you that you're more likely to see things like, you know, hawthorn and, um, and rowan and oak and that sort of thing up there. You know, so tune in, see what's going on. Are you in a National Trust estate where they've planted exotic species? Are you out in farmland where you're more likely just to see the native species? It's really important because it all kind of builds a bigger picture because you're not just looking at the detail of the tree, you're looking at the surrounding habitat and environment, and that's really tuning into nature. And that's important because, you know, you can use this when you're foraging, particularly when you're looking for mushrooms, looking for not only the, the thing itself, but the wider habitat. And when you spot those habitats, you can think, that's where I'm going to go, possibly to find the thing I'm looking for. So tuning in is really important. Principle number two, begin with a branch. Simply, when you get to the tree, get a young, healthy twig. Everything is there. And in spring, of course, there's going to be flowers and young leaves to look at, not just the buds. OK, so everything you need to know about the tree is on a young, healthy branch. There are other signs with some trees like silver birch, where the bark just stands out like a sore thumb. But generally, begin with a branch and everything you need is on the end of a healthy twig. Not this one. It's dead. Uh, right. Number three is a question. Is it alternate or opposite? So in springtime, we're looking sometimes at the bud arrangement, sometimes at the leaf arrangement, because even now, even though we're in mid-April, there's quite a few trees which still aren't out in leaf. And we'll talk about that as we do our spring tree calendar. Just to explain what that means briefly, this is what you want to look at. Get your young healthy twig and do the, do the um, young leaves, all the buds appear as they do on the left, alternately, one, two, three, four, five, or do they appear in opposite pairs, two, four, six on the branch? That's important. Because the more you get used to that, you just, it's about pattern recognition and your eye recognises, oh, it's one of the trees that has opposite buds. OK, it can probably only be one of these. And it all just helps. And it also gets you tuning in and looking at what's important first before you look at all the other details. Let me just show you what that looks like. Here's the elder in spring, early spring, very clearly with opposite leaves. So you can see uh, out of the buds, two sets of leaves bursting out there in opposite pairs. So that's the elder that does that. Then on the other end of the spectrum, we have blackthorn, which is alternate. Most UK trees are alternate. Only a few are opposite of the natives anyway. Um, and you can see this is one, two, three on the blackthorn as the little blossoms just starting to come out there. So notice that's the difference between alternate and opposite. I've gone through that quite quickly there, folks. But as I say, I go through it slower in our winter tree ID um, webinar. <laughs> Let's talk about the spring tree calendar, okay? So the spring tree calendar is looking at what's happening at different parts of the year, okay? So, um, you know, tree field guides can tell you kind of what to look at, but they don't always say when to look for the certain things. They might say, here's the flower of the hawthorn, but it might not say when exactly it flowers. You presume spring, but you know, there's a big difference between March and, you know, late May, isn't there, in terms of when you might see a flower. So this is really good. And the more you notice, the more you look at this, the more, of course, it will be useful because the following year you'll spot those same patterns coming out. So the big one, of course, is the blackthorn, which we'll get to, which is out now looking really good. Let's go through the spring tree calendar from early spring right to the very cr uh, uh, crest of summer and see what we've got. This is before spring, really. Elder leaves come out as early as January the end of January, early February. They're the first native tree to come into leaf. Um, so it's a very early sign of spring. So if you're looking across the kind of understory of the woodland and you're seeing green sprouting out at an understory level, it's likely to be the elder tree. And then you can get close to it and have your ID confirmed, looking for those opposite buds and opposite leaves. One of the really early ones to look out for. Another one is the hazel flowers. 
beautiful little female flowers here, which will then eventually become the hazelnuts. You see these at the back end of winter, very early spring as well. You can see these in, in January sometimes at the back end. Generally, February is the best time for it. And uh, beautiful little flowers, like little sea anemones um, sticking out of those buds there. Very small, but beautiful to look at nonetheless. I wonder if you've seen these yourself, pop it in the chat room and let us know if this is something you've spotted um, um, in early spring this year. That would be good to know. But a really good one to look out for and a great splash of colour at that time of year. Another one, um, kind of very much at the back end of winter, early spring, um, sometimes a little bit later this year, actually, is the older flowers. These are the female flowers, which look like little pink cotton buds there, uh, really do stand out there. And uh, yeah, those are going to become the cones of the older later in the year. But again, another little really lovely splash of colour on one of our common trees, the older tree, which is a tree that likes really wet feet. Then we're going to move into early spring. And the big one I mentioned earlier is the blackthorn, which is still out where we are on mass. If you're in southern England, actually, let us know. Um, is the blackthorn still looking good or has it gone over already? Whereas I'm in northeast Wales, you see, so things might be a little bit further behind. Let us know in the chat if your blackthorn is still looking good now on April 19th, because a lot of people have told me that the blackthorn seems to be particularly good this year. Um, for me, I think it certainly seems to have had a, a longer season than usual. Good, I'm getting some responses. This is good because it lets me know people are listening. <laughs> good, everyone's still awake. Fantastic. So uh, in Lancashire, people, uh, Jackie's saying it's just finishing, whereas Valerie says still good in Suffolk. That's interesting. So one in the north, one in the south. And, you know, actually it, it seems to depend on the, well, what's going on locally. Yeah, in Ireland, Kate says it's flying, looking really good. It's still looking good here. I think it's just starting to see all the blossom dropping off now, but it's there's still enough on that it looks good. There's the blackthorn on mass. You see these, this, you know, this white, you know, mass on hedgerows. And if you're driving in your car, um, you'll see it on the roadside. All this, all this white blossom at that scrub level. That is blackthorn. It's the first white flower to come out on mass that we really notice. Bear says it's looking good in Scotland. Good to know. And blackthorn good in Brighton. Well, there you go. Seems to me that it doesn't really make a difference there too much where you are. It depends on local conditions. Uh, so that's really interesting to know, getting a good snapshot of the blackthorn. And of course, the blackthorn blossom comes out, but the leaves aren't out yet. The blossom comes out first. And that's a really good thing to know for ID, because blackthorn is a tree that's often planted or grows alongside hawthorn, which in winter, people can get them confused because they can look fairly similar. They're both thorny, shrubby trees, very scrubby in hedgerows, planted alongside and intertwining each other. But here, the blackthorn blossom comes out first. And then the hawthorn leaves burst out en masse. So in kind of early spring, you'll see blackthorn blossom and then green hawthorn leaves and they're side by side. The hawthorn blossom doesn't come out until later. And there's the hawthorn leaves looking really bright, really vibrant green, a very welcome sign of spring. And we notice it because there's so much of it, it's very common. As we said, the elder is the first tree to come into leaf, but the hawthorn is lining our hedgerows. It's the one we probably really notice first because it's everywhere, especially on roadsides and alongside footpaths. The other thing you're going to see in early spring is the willow catkins start to come out, particularly the goat willow. That's the first one to come out, followed by the grey willow afterwards. And those are two very similar trees. Um, the goat willow catkins come out just before. They're also known as pussy willow because the little young catkins there, you can stroke them like a little cat's paw, nice and soft. To, to, to touch there. So they've got that uh, an old country name as well. But these are the um, young male catkins just coming out. And you get this in early spring, kind of, you know, you know, anywhere from mid-March onwards, really, maybe a little bit later, depending on what's going on with the weather. It was pretty cold in March, wasn't it, this year? We had a lot of snow where we are. But look out for that. And you see this grey swathe across kind of uh, like the, the, the lower tree level rather than, than high up. Um, and it's a fantastic sight. And now those have matured. And have we got a picture now? Yeah. And now they're, this is a little bit early. They're looking even more yellow than this now. In fact, all, all our willows where we are right now are looking spot on. You get this burst of yellow pollen just everywhere. These bottle brushes. We got it there? No, that's something else. So you get these bottle brushes zooming out there. And all our goat and grey willows are looking fantastic at the minute. And you just see that again on the roadside. And that's great because when you do that tune in exercise, widen your vision. And you'll see these clumps of yellow at this time of year. And it's got to be a willow tree. 
So it's really useful. You can get your eye in looking for that pastel yellow color and start to look at those gray green leaves as well, which are coming out too. So the catkins on these willows come out before the leaves. That's useful to know as well. Willows are related to poplars. So poplars come out around the same time as well in early spring. There's a white poplar on the left and the black poplar on the right. The black poplar is one of our rarest um, native trees, although you do get a hybrid planted in urban areas, which looks very similar, to be fair. And the flowers look very similar. But you see these red dangling catkins here. Um, that's the male catkins on the left and the right of the white and black poplar. And the female catkins look a little bit different. But these pink catkins, lovely show of colour again before the leaves come out. A good one to look out for in early spring. Here's another nice one that comes out in March, the witch elm. I know there's a couple of people watching in Brighton at the minute, and there you have a real stronghold of English elm. These flowers have probably gone over by this point in April, but look out for them. Beautiful little burst of kind of purple pink fireworks. The witch elm is what we get near us, and that's probably the more common elm around uh, the UK and Ireland. But uh, the English elm much less seen because of Dutch elm disease, although witch elm gets it as well which um, seems to have taken it a little bit better. But these beautiful um, bursts of firework will turn into seeds and actually they're looking like young seeds now. So that's a really lovely flower because it's very unique when you see that flowering kind of um, end of March time and it doesn't look like anything else. It's got to be an elm tree. It's a really nice detail to look out for. Oops, so I skipped ahead. This is field maple. Uh, field maple, our only native maple tree. Sycamore's also maple, but it's not a native. These are quite small, these flowers. This kind of whole burst of flowers, probably only about so big. Um, and lovely little green flowers, you know, nice little bit, fresh bit of green. But notice they come out the same time as the leaves. And in fact, we've moved into mid spring now, We're away from early spring. This is mid spring. So these are all starting to come out now um, onwards. Annabelle says, what's the difference between the male and female catkins? Depends which species of tree you're talking about. Uh, let us know which one, Annabelle, and I will do my best to answer the question. Um, very different from one tree to the other. So on the poplars, Mark says, I'm losing the sound. Everybody else hearing me okay? Let us know if you can hear me okay and all okay. That's good. Okay. Maybe it might be something with your connection, Mark. Hopefully it's not me. Any problems, folks, with sound or vision, just let us know. So uh, with the um, poplars, the male catkins on the white and black are red. The females are not, they're more, um, they're a green colour and then they eventually go all fluffy with seeds and those seeds fly all over the place like willows. That's the difference. But that happens later in spring at the back end of spring. There's the small flowers of the field maple. Here's the goat willow again. So we saw the young catkins earlier and then in mid spring, the flowers, are, sorry, the leaves are coming out and that's just starting now. The leaves are following on from behind the catkins. And you can see the thing about willows is, Scan across the landscape, where first you get the, the, those washes of um, pastel yellow and bright yellow. As spring moves on, you get that grey green colour or pastel green colour. And that is the willows, particularly the sallows and the white willow as well. And you see those in the landscape. They're different to the fresh green of the hawthorn. You can see the differences um, when you look across it. Also, the female catkins of the willow are a grey green colour too. So that really helps. We'll get onto the differences between male and females in a bit. The ash comes out in mid-spring as well with its flowers, um, if it's not got ash dye back. Um, the flowers are interesting. First, they look like little bursts of kind of blackberry or raspberry kind of bursting out the twig, almost like it's got some kind of fungal disease, all these little growths. But then they just burst and come out from the, the bud here, as you can see, and really just kind of crescendo into this kind of spewing of flower, which just comes out of these buds, this huge flower, uh, with a lot of kind of texture to it, lovely stuff with all these little kind of crimson red tips to it, really nice. Um, and it's a good one to look out for. We don't often think of flowers when we think of the ash, but they're lovely stuff. And they're, they're on their way out now. They're coming out now where we are. So another good one to look out for. There's the ash again. Still, look, there's the black leaf buds here, still dormant. They'll burst with the leaves soon. So flowers out before the leaves. Here's the sycamore. Sycamore flowers, a little bit young, the sycamore flower, it's still got to mature a bit, but it's just bursting out, spewing out of the bud there, along with the leaves as well. It's a big bud with the sycamore, a big, you know, lovely pendulous kind of green catkin there that comes out the sycamore 
Uh, quite different to the field maple, which was much more kind of lots of stalks. So another nice difference between those two maples there. Um, let's have a quick look. There's the mature sycamore uh, flower there, looking much more pendulous there, much older. This is the beech, beech flowers, uh, lovely kind of pollen. Those are the male flowers there. Maybe there might be a couple of females in there as well. This one at the end might be female, uh, which would eventually turn into a nut. But that's definitely mostly male uh, flowers. Look a little bit like the beech mass, don't they? They've got that kind of character. And there's the young beech leaves as well out at the same time. So we're getting further into spring here. These probably aren't quite out yet. Um, they might be where you are, but they're not where we are at the minute. But lovely little kind of uh, pom-poms there dangling on the beech trees. And of course, on nice sunny days, these are full of pollinators, of course, really important uh, uh, food source. There's the female flower, which doesn't have the pollen on, of course, but that's what needs to get fertilized. So then that can turn into the beech mast and produce the nuts on the end. A bit more of a subtle flower, but it's there. It's really nice to notice these details. Here's the hawthorn now. So another old name for hawthorn is Maythorn because the flowers traditionally come out in May. Though with climate change, we're seeing them come out in April as well. We certainly came out in April last year. So you might even start to see them coming out now. Any minute, the hawthorn is just going to burst with blossom. So remember in the hedges, we have blackthorn blossom first, hawthorn leaves, and then hawthorn blossom. That's the order. As the hawthorn blossom comes out, the blackthorn blossom should be dying off or even gone by that point. So you get two flushes of white in the hedgerow. And the hawthorn blossom smells of um, almonds and marzipan. Really, unfortunately, it doesn't taste like that. It tastes not much of anything at all, really. You can't eat them. But they've got a lovely smell of almond or marzipan. There's the cherry. They're out now. Um, so probably should sort of swap the order of those two pictures. But the cherry are out now. The wild cherry looking very good. Of course, there's a lot of blossoming um, cherries and uh, cultivars of cherry cultivated um, for their um, blossom rather than their fruit. That you'll get in kind of amenity areas and parks like you're seeing this one here. Um, and there you go, there's the wild cherry blossom close up as well, looking really good, nice kind of fragrant blossom, and of course the insects love it as well. Oak trees, there's the oak flowers, and we'll get into detail with them a little bit later, but we're getting now into late spring now, this is late spring, just getting onto the cusp of summer. You can see the young oak leaves coming out, this isn't happening quite yet, but it's something to look out for in the next few weeks. And they spew out with these kind of knobbly, you know, clusters, almost sort of like looking like green popcorn on strings. These, these are the, uh, the male catkins spewing out. And if you look carefully, you might see the pink female flowers at the tops and the tips of, uh, of, of those various buds there. And we'll get some closer pictures of those later. Lovely details. And again, we just don't think of flowers so much when we think of oak trees. We think of the acorn and the leaf, but there's more to it, more to the picture. There you go. There's a picture close up. You can see again. Um, and what's nice here is from this bud, look, there's last year's growth, the woody growth where my cursor is. And look beyond, look how the tree has spewed all this out in the spring. So all that flowers have come out there, and out of that cluster of buds, and then all that leaf growth, all on that stalk. So there's its growth for this year. Fantastic just to see that, you know, the way it bursts out and extends itself. It really shows you how trees grow each year. Really nice to see. Horse chestnut um that's a late one as well with it's big candles of flowers you can't miss them bees love them as well and hoverflies too huge tall candles of flowers everything about the horse chestnut is big the buds are big the leaves are big the flowers are big and the nuts are big everything's big with the horse chestnut not a native tree it's a naturalized tree um uh but uh yeah very common around the place the conquer tree and then uh, the rowan trees are coming out as well later in the uh, kind of on the yeah, back end of spring as well um, for the clusters of creamy white flowers. Lots of tiny little white uh, five petal flowers coming out in clusters, looking a little bit like elderflower, but without the fragrance. And there's the elder, which is the one that most people associate, probably the flower that most people associate with a tree, because, of course, it's got that big wild food connection. And people love the smell. And really, when we get into elderflowers, we're getting into summer. So spring is gone and it's the arrival of summer, I think, with the elderflowers at the back end of May, start of June. So there's a quick whistle stop tour. Um, also, guys, I've got a, um, a tree ID um, uh, guide. I'm going to pop that. Is that there? Is that got, there you go. So I put in a, oh, that's not the right link. Let me just get you the link. 
that's another link. Let me just stop my screen share for a minute. And I'm going to get you guys a link to um, a guide that I've made, Spring Tree Flower Guide. That's there as well. There we go. Let's pop that back on. And I'm going to get you that link. You can now share your screen. I made a, a guide, basically, that... Um, nope. Stop share. There we go. Share your screen. Where's the presentation? Nope. It's already disappeared. There we go. Hang on a minute, folks. Technology. Where's Zoom? Share. Okay, we're back in the game. Uh, <laughs> so there we go, folks. Um, I'll show you the link for this um, this guide now as soon as I can get the chat room up. There it is. I made a, a free spring flower guide, which you're welcome to grab and download or use with your groups and print some off. Um, it's on the website. Feel free to download that, folks. And uh, you can have a look at that as well. And uh, it gives you a bit of a kind of a whistle stop tour there, what we've just done as well on the webinar. OK, let's go to our next section. Whoops. There we go. Catkins on trees. We saw a little bit of catkins there, but let's go into detail a little bit about what's going on with catkins. Where are we? Catkins on trees. So catkins, basically, they're pendulous, long flowers. There's a good example there, different to the kind of petal flowers that we think of traditionally. Um, dangling from the twig, swaying in the breeze, and you've got the male catkins releasing pollen in clouds, certainly at this time of year, a lot of the species. And they're relying very much on wind dispersal as well, insects as well, but a lot of wind dispersal for sure. Sue Gosling asks, does the horse chestnut have pink flowers as well as white? Yes, but not the native. Well, it's sorry, not the native, not the uh, the, the normal uh, horse chestnut. Um, there is a red horse chestnut. It's from America, and in America they call it buckeye. So if you see the red one, it's not the common horse chestnut, but it's uh, it's just another one that's been planted. So here's the um, older flat, uh, older catkins, and the picture on the left is them when they're young, and the picture on the right is when they're older, older, olders. Um, <laughs> catkins, as they mature, they get more pendulous, and all catkins do this. They start off quite small and hard, and they get pendulous and open up, turn yellowish in colour, and start releasing all those clouds of pollen there. Uh, and many of these catkins can be seen as early as the previous autumn and hang around right through the winter. If you look at hazel here, these hazel catkins here, which are young, just hang around all winter. And then at the back end of winter, they just elongate and just release these clouds of pollen to those tiny little red flowers that we saw earlier, the kind of the pinky red anemone flowers, and they become the, the uh, hazelnuts. But if you knock these catkins on a sunny day at the end of winter, you'll get these clouds of pollen um, spewing out there, which is lovely to see. Um, but it's just nice to notice that on the hazel there as well. So you've got the early and late catkins there of the hazel. Oops. Another tree that has catkins is the birch. I love the birch. It's my favourite tree. Um, so, so many bushcraft uses and it's just a beautiful looking tree as well. Um, and there you've got, interesting, you've got kind of, you know, male catkins, but also the female. And we're going to get into this now. The male catkins are the big, long, dangling ones you can see with the brown spots all over them. That's the male catkins and they're going to release the pollen. The female catkins are the little kind of bananas which are sticking upright sticking erect um out of these uh, just behind these leaves there's one female catkin there and there's another one there as well and there's one out of focus up here as well on my cursories so you've got the male and female parts of the tree on the same tree here and that's interesting because most trees are like this they're what you call mono monoaceous um so they have both the male and female kind of sexual organs on the same uh twig there so most of them have that oaks birch uh, beech trees like that they all have the male and female parts on the same twig not all trees have this though and this is interesting uh, there's the birch again you can see the the female um catkins up close and the male right next to it so the pollen doesn't have far to go <laughs> however there's quite a few trees which are dioecious which means they have separate male and female trees and spring and autumn is the time when you'll notice this because only the males have the pollen bearing flowers or catkins on them and only the uh, females will uh, bear the fruit or nuts um, in the uh, autumn time whereas in the summer and winter it's pretty much uh, difficult to discover which one it is um, so this is interesting because you won't only see just goat willow you'll see male and female goat willow 
So we said earlier how that kind of swathe of yellow, that's the male willows, whereas the grey green is the female willows. That grey green will come as the male flowers die off and they have their grey green foliage. But at this time of year, yellow and grey green are the separate two. So here we go. You have monoaceous, which in botany means it has, has the stamens and the pistils and separate flowers on the same plant, which is the male and female parts. Diaceous, having the male and female organs on separate individual plants. So then the male pollen has to find a female tree in order to uh, fertilize it and do its thing. And that's where the wind and insects help and do their thing. Here's the male parts of the goat willow again. You can see the yellow pollen just form in there. So what that means is with a lot of these tree species, you've got two lots of flowers to look out for. There's the male flowers of goat willow, and there's the female flowers of goat willow. Same species, totally different flower. So you're not looking at two different species here. It's the same one, but with male or female flowers, depending on which tree you're looking at. So that's really key to know, folks, because uh, it can help uh, save a lot of confusion all around. Look how different those female flowers are to the male if I flick back there, quite different. Those ones, uh, these ones here are going to become more bottle brush like in, in appearance, whereas these remain spiky. But the colour palette is very different of the two. Here's the aspen flower, uh, aspen catkins here, which are, um, I can't remember if that's the male or female off the top of my head, actually. What is it? Um, yeah, I'm not sure of that one. I think that's the, I think that's the male. We'll see. But there's the, yeah, that's the male. That's the male catkins. There's the female catkins of the aspen, um, which are much greener. And they're going to start to uh, produce the seeds later on. And they fluff up into big, fluffy kind of um, you know, tails and then release all the seeds. So they look quite different. There's the goat willow female flowers. Uh, later in the season, later in the spring, they're going to fluff up and start releasing those clouds. And you see all these kind of fallen catkins um, on the ground, take, you know, in gutters, curbsides maybe in the schoolyard where you work, if you've got this, you'll spot this everywhere. And if you can get it dry, it makes good fire lighting material as well. Nice, fluffy, um, natural material to light your fires with. So, um, yeah, there it is again. Nice to see those mature female catkins. So has everybody got that? With certain trees, willows, poplars, holly, juniper, yew, they're all dioecious, so they all have separate male or females. Anything else? I can't think off the top of my head what else there is. Um, but most trees are monoaceous, which means they have the male and female parts together on the same tree. I hope that's clear as mud to everybody. I'll just check in. Everybody okay for now? All making sense? Good, good, good. Yeah, lots of happy faces, which is good. Brilliant. Okay, let's go back on. Brilliant. Thank you, Antonia. Uh, OK, let's go back on. Let's go to tiny but beautiful flowers. Some flowers that you might not have noticed on trees. I want to draw your attention to it because there's some stunning stuff. And this is nice to do with, you know, the kids that you work with is to get them to look close and notice these things that they might not ever have noticed before. So with their hand lenses or even magnifying glasses, most of these you can see with the naked eye. Um, let's have a look at them now. First of all, the hornbeam. This is a tree that's more common in southern Britain. We get a few here up in northeast Wales, but they're mostly in like National Trust estates, things like that. Don't tend to get it out in the countryside, just more southern Britain. You can get it in hedges. But here's the flower, male and female on the same tree. So it's monoaceous. And let's put the chat on so I can see if anyone's got any questions. Um, there's the male flowers there dangling down. Here's the female flowers here looking quite different. Again, the pollen doesn't have far to travel. But let's get a bit closer on that. You can see them there, the hornbeam, lovely little flowers coming out um, a bit later in the year. You can see the size difference here between the male catkins and the female flowers. The male catkins are much more dominant there. But there's the female flowers up close, looking like the hazel flowers, but bigger. Um, again, like a little sea anemone spewing out there. Lovely stuff. And this is a really lovely you know, kind of detail to notice in kind of uh, mid to late spring. So you know, check that out with the hornbeam. It's a good one to know. This is the spindle. Spindle is out with its leaves now, but the flowers come a little bit later. The flowers are lovely, really distinctive. The spindle is a small, bushy, a shrubby tree. Get it in hedgerows. I think it likes kind of chalk soils off the top of my head. Um, oops, 
And but if you look at flowers, they're very distinctive because they're green and they only have four petals. Most flowers have five. These only have four and they're a cross. They look a little bit like a windmill. So really distinctive. And that's really useful as well because um, the bud or leaf arrangement is also in opposite pairs. Remember we talked about that at the start, the key principle of tree ID, is it alternate or opposite? With a spindle, they're opposite. So the leaves are in, um, in opposites as well. Can we see that on this previous picture? Not very well, but the flowers are also kind of in a cross in kind of opposites as well. So it kind of follows that pattern, which is really handy. Nice. So Mark asks, would the tree bearing berries on trees such as you, Holly and Juniper be female? Yes. Only the female on you, Juniper and Holly bear berries, which is why on Holly trees you don't always see berries. Sometimes it's because of shading as well, but it's only the females that bear the berries. So the male trees on those three trees don't have uh, fruits. Here's the flower of the oak. Now we've already seen the male flower, which is this big kind of knobbly green catkin spewing out. But look up here. We see at the tip those little tiny little kind of bright red flowers. Those are the flowers, the female flowers of the oak tree. And it's really lovely to see it. It's a detail that I'm hoping most of you have not really noticed before, but something to really look out for. Lovely stuff. Um, only out for a short time. In fact, actually, the leaves are edible when you first get them on oak. You can put them in salads, but soon they get full of tannins and become unpalatable. But there's lovely little female flowers there. Look at that there. Lovely little burst of colour. Again, that you know kids might not have noticed before. A really nice thing to look out for. And there they are. Very small. I struggle to get the focus on that with the camera. Pretty small, you can see there. But you can see them with the naked eye. But it's really nice to have a hand lens or magnifying glass so kids can appreciate it even more. Check it out. A good one to know. Anything else you want to say about it? Yeah, they look like little tiny jewels. Yeah. They really do. Good, good, good. Let's go into a pair of trees in detail now. So wild cherry versus bird cherry. Two native cherry trees. We have two native cherry trees in this country. Uh, wild cherry is one of the, the cherries you can eat. Bird cherry is the one that's got cherries only fit for birds because they're really sour. Um, let's have a look at the difference there in spring. Here's the wild cherry flowers. There you go there. Five petals and appearing in clusters in bunches. OK, so pe most people will know cherry blossom. It's very common on school grounds, cherry blossom. So a lot of you guys might be familiar with that for sure. There it is up close again. Lovely fragrance to it. And you can see the leaves are not far behind. They're coming out as well. And here in this picture, you can really see the arrangement. See how the, the, the blossom is kind of out in a kind of a almost like a fan shape, like a round ball. They're a bit flattened there, but you can see how they kind of all cluster from one point. And that really demonstrates that form because that's really important when you compare it to bird cherry. Here's bird cherry, similar leaves, but completely different flowers. They look a little bit like the horse chestnut flowers, don't they? But they're more banana-like shape. Whereas the horse chestnut flowers we saw earlier are more like kind of towers of like a tower candle, um, like a cone. Whereas these are more like a banana. And this is great because there's not really any other trees that have flowers like this in the hedgerow. So when you're driving around or walking around, you might spot this and you can see bird cherry. And that's great because bird cherry is one of those trees that in winter and summertime and autumn, mm. to an extent, they kind of fade into the greenery, whereas in spring they absolutely zing out. So for me, bird cherry is the season, uh, sorry, spring is the season to see bird cherry. It really just stand out like a sore thumb. And then when you notice that, you can then watch that tree the rest of the year and get to know it. Once you, so look for this either now or very soon. Yeah, it's probably a little bit early for it at the minute. Look for this and get to know bird cherry. Um, it's a beautiful tree. Don't eat the cherries though, they're awful. <laughs> so just fit for birds. And there's the uh, flowers. You can see that banana shape there. But the leaves of wild and bird cherry look very similar. Yeah. The flowers smell strongly of almonds as well. I've forgotten that. I've just written that down. Yeah, good. So that's the wild cherry and bird cherry, two similar trees, but really quite different. Just checking with everybody. Everybody okay for now? Yeah, good, good, good. Thumbs up, that's good to see. Let's go on to telling similar flowers apart. So we've looked at some which are very different. 
whole lot of white flowers I've called this section because in spring you get a whole lot of white flowers on trees a whole lot of white flowers with five petals here you go here's four different tree species and uh, but they're all very similar flowers hopefully some of these you're starting to recognize from the pictures I've shared but at first glance they all look pretty similar they're white they all come out in spring and they've all got five petals we're going to break down and look at the differences now Bear in mind what we talked about before, the spring tree calendar. It's not just what you're looking at, it's when you see it. That's important. So you can see there we've got the blackthorn um, up at the, um, up the uh, top left. And that's a really early one, isn't it? So let's have a little look now. Here's the blackthorn. So the flower comes out early, doesn't it? Um, kind of uh, March time, you can see that when it's still out now. <laughs> gets us thinking about tuning into the time of year. The blossom comes out before the leaves. So there's that to think about as well. Do you see blossom on its own or blossom with leaves or leaves first, then flowers with certain trees? And it's en masse in our hedgerows in March. There it is. Look out for the thorns, of course. But there it is with its white flowers en masse. Then let's look at hawthorn. Hawthorn, remember the leaves come out first. You get the green leaves first. Then in May, or April, the blossom comes out. The leaves have matured. They've got darker in color. Look how the leaves have changed. Nice light green there. And now darker green and more strongly lobed as they mature. And you get this almond smelling blossom. The petals are much more rounded. And you've also got these little uh, pink tipped anthers as well. So the male and female parts of the flower are in the same uh, flower. Uh, parts of the, the flower are in each individual flower there. Um, so that's the hawthorn flower there. You can get pink varieties of hawthorn. There's some cultivars and other ones as well, like Paul's Scarlet. So look out, occasionally you'll see, especially near towns and things, pink um, or even red uh, hawthorn flowers. But our native is white. This is crabapple now. Um, crabapple is the largest blossom flower of our native trees. What we're not getting in this uh, show is kind of scale here but they're bigger, not massive, but, you know, a good, good size on the crab apple. Uh, when the flower is fully open, notice that there's a gap between the petals. See the gap here? Whereas with the hawthorn, there's no gap, is there, so much? A little bit, but not as pronounced as this. The gap is much more obvious um, with the uh, petals there. And what I like to say as well is think about the inside of an apple core. If you slice an apple open, you've got that. It looks like the blossom the five points there. And there's even the gaps in the points uh, between where the pips are there as well. So it really follows that pattern. I think it's a really nice way of remembering the crab apple blossom. The other way to remember crab apple, of course, to identify it is to look on the floor and there'll probably be some rotten apple still hanging around. So that's always a good thing to look out for too. There's the crab apple leaves, very different to the kind of the blackthorn and hawthorn particularly leaves, very different there. There you go, fallen apples on the floor. <laughs> That's what you want to look out for. That's a winter sign, but you might still see some hanging around in spring. Now the rowan, another tree with clusters of flowers. It's much smaller flowers than the uh, crab apple and in clusters in what they call umbels. The flowers come out in May. The leaves are superficially similar to the elder and the flowers are as well. So it could be one you could confuse it for at first glance, but they don't have the fragrance of the elder flowers and they're also out earlier. But the key principal difference between elder and rowan is to go back to our first rule. Are the leaves alternate or opposite? With rowan, the leaves are alternate, two, four, six, eight on the branch. Sorry, uh, one, two, three, four, five on the branch, excuse me. With elder, they're in pairs two, four, six, eight. So go back to that principle. That's really useful for getting your eye in and um, working out what you're looking at. And also, yeah, with the rowan, you get kind of five to eight pairs of leaflets as well, a lot more than you get with the elder. There's the rowan there. You can see the leaf behind, a leaf made up of lots of little leaflets. What you're seeing there is one leaf made up of leaflets. Okay. Here's the elder though, similar. Similar flowers, but coming out a little bit later, much more fragrant and a more creamy color to them uh, than the than the rowan. Rowan a little bit more white. Um, and there's the leaves. There's less leaflets per leaf, usually kind of 
five to seven um, on the elder. Yeah, five to seven leaflets. So less leaflets all round. There's the elder leaf there looking good all round. So we've got some very similar leaves there. OK. Right, folks, it's time for a quiz. Sue says elder cordial is beautiful. It is. Let's do a quick quiz. You've had a real whistle stop tour there of trees in spring. I'm going to share some pictures with you now. So pen and paper at the ready. If you're watching the recording, you can, you know, pause the recording to write down your answer and study the pictures longer. But because we're a little bit short on time, we're going to give each picture about 10 to 20 seconds. We're going to move on to the next one. So get your pen and paper ready. Write down the number of the uh, question and write down your answers. And then we'll go through it briefly at the end. We're not going to see who's you know who the winners are we're not competing against each other it's just for your own learning as a recap folks so here we go what have we got here number one what tree is this don't put it in the chat just write it down folks for now what tree have we got here a common tree of southern britain but you get it everywhere what tree is this one these are the male flowers of this tree okay next one what was this flower? Do you remember? Very distinctive, a green small flower, which looks like a windmill, cross, four petals, quite distinctive. It's a small shrubby tree, this one. The leaves come out before the flowers. Okay, next one. What was this tree here? Do you guys remember? Write it down if you know the answer. I will accept the family for this one. You don't have to put the exact species. Um, the family will be fine because a lot of the, the flowers are very similar between them. Um, this is out in March time. OK, next one. What's this? This flower isn't fully mature. It's spewing out there. Um, big, long catkin. Uh, we've got a bit of a clue there with the leaves. Might help you out a little bit. <laughs> so a uh, bit of extra information there for you. Very common tree. Oops. Yep, there we go. Next one. Um, this one here. I almost said it. We've got two pictures here to give you information. We've got the mature flower on the left, and we've got the young leaves just coming out on the right. Everything about this tree is big. It's a tree that really shouts its presence at every time of the year. What have we got here, folks? Write it down if you think you know. This one here, what have we got here? What's going on? What tree is this? And again, I'll accept the, the family for this one, not the exact species, family is fine. Okay, next one. What have we got here, folks? We've got some catkins. We've got male and female catkins on the same branch here. The leaves are alternate, not opposite. Very common tree. And the, it's, uh, the pollen is dispersed by the wind. And so are the seeds when they're mature. As those female catkins mature, this break, they break up into lots of tiny little seeds which disperse on the wind. So a really nice thing to do with kids in the autumn is get them to crush up the, uh, the mature female catkins of this tree which I'm not going to name. Next one. What's this one? I'm hoping most people know this one. You should be seeing it now. You, hopefully you've seen it today. White blossom early in spring and into mid-spring. Next one. What's going on here? This is a flower of a common tree. Is it a male or female? No extra points for saying that, but, uh, you know, just good to know for your own learning. Is it a male or female, this one? Uh, a, tree, a flower of a very common tree. Again, I'll accept the family for this one. You don't need to get the exact species. Here's another one. That hopefully we know this is looking like this right now. Uh, in this state, currently. Very well-known blossom. Again, I'm whizzing through these a little bit because we're short on time. We can always go back and watch it back later if you need to, folks, or with the recording, you can pause it. Okay, here's four plants. 
side by side, four trees, I should say, in blossom with their five petaled white flowers. We'll call this one A, this one B, this one C, and this one D. I'll give you a little bit longer on this one. So A, top left, B, top right, C, bottom left, and D, bottom right. What do you think, folks? Write it down. So there's four points up for grabs here. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next one, folks. Here we go. Here's another toughie. And there's a couple of things I've not even talked about tonight, just for fun, just to be cruel. Um, they're all native trees, though. Yep. So we've got four here. We've got A, top left. B, top right. C, bottom left. And D, bottom right. These are all generally smaller flowers in clusters, in umbels, but they're not all, um, none of them are umbellifers, but they're in the form of the flower is an umbel. Two of them are related. A little bit cruel, this one, because as I said, two of these we've not discussed at all tonight. But let's see what you know, give yourself a test, and it might be something you notice out and about. Okay. What's this one? I haven't talked about this either. <laughs> now I'm just being unkind. Another native tree. So that should help you a little bit. And look at the whole picture. Not just the flower. There's some big clues there. This is the male flower. Looks like a stretched out pineapple. Okay. This is a really cruel one. <laughs> this is another native tree. I'll give you that. Uh, female flowers on the left, male flowers on the right. Tiny flowers. Um, you need a good lens to get this one. Um, so I borrowed this picture. Um, tiny little flowers. You wouldn't really notice them. Um, there's much more kind of distinctive features to look out for on this tree to identify it. But it's nice to see them and nice to know that these trees do actually have spring flowers. If you know what this one is or you want to have to guess, um, pop it, write it down. I think we're going to run over by about five minutes, folks. I hope that's okay. So we'll go back to the answers in a minute. There's this one here. What have we got here? We have talked about this, but we haven't seen any pictures of it tonight. This is the male flower. Big clouds of pollen when you knock this branch. Vicky's asking, can I watch this back? She's got to leave early. Yep, um, I think FSA are going to share this with everyone who's booked on and it'll be on the YouTube channel soon. Uh, yeah, you'll be able to watch this back for sure. So hopefully we'll see you um, again, Vicky. Go look after your kids, that's important. <laughs> okay. Right, let's go back through. We're going to whiz back through them from the start and go through it very quickly as to what we got. Okay, here we go, folks. If you know what this is, pop it in the chat room. Let's see. What have we got? What do people write down? Who's first out the gate? Yep, it is the beach. Well done, folks. It's the beech tree. These are the male flowers mostly. Next one. Pop it in the chat room. What do we get? Spindle. Brilliant. This is the spindle tree. This little windmill flowers. Next one. What do we got here, folks? Kate's written witch elm as a question. Well, no, I know that's spell check. This is the witch elm, W-Y-C-H. That happens to me all the time. Uh, the witch elm, I would have accepted elm as well because other elm flowers look very similar. But this is witch elm. Um, fantastic. Here we go. What have we got here, folks? Sycamore. Brilliant. That's the sycamore tree. Fantastic. Uh, with its young uh, flowers just kind of spewing out there. There's the, uh, the maple-like leaves here as well. That's a good giveaway, too, that at least we've got one of the maples anyway. How about this one, folks? Yep, chestnut or horse chestnut or conquer tree. I'll accept any of those. That's fine. Um, yeah, that's the conquer tree, isn't it? The horse chestnut there. It's massive leaves and it's flowers. Well done, folks. Loads of people putting their answer in. Good stuff. Oh, George has got, uh, got ahead of the gate there. I think it's getting a bit competitive now. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> oak. I haven't even shown the picture yet. That's the oak tree. Absolutely. Um, 
I would say probably the sessile oak if out of the two, but I think it's it's an oak tree. Um, so there we go. Difficult to tell with the young flowers. That's the oak tree there. This one is, as people are saying, the birch, the birch tree. Oh, sorry, the, the slides are skipping forward. That's not me. Uh, this is the birch tree here. Uh, male and female parts on the same twig. Next up, blackthorn. Everybody's got that one, it looks like. Yeah. And if you haven't got these, don't worry, folks. It's all learning, isn't it? It's not a test. Um, it's all just learning. If you come away with two trees, you know better tonight. I'm happy with that. That's great. Here we go. What have we got here, folks? Yep, female goat willow. That's right. Well, I'd also accept willow because the female flowers do look very similar on a lot of willows. Um, but it is a female goat willow, this one. That's for sure. It's grey-green flower. Grey willow looks extremely similar to it. This one here, folks, is the wild cherry. That's right, the wild cherry tree. If you got that right, give it a tick on your paper. Next one. Whoops. Okay. A in the top left is the blackthorn. B top right is the crabapple. C, bottom left, is the wild cherry. We just saw the whole tree. And D, bottom right, is the hawthorn. Well, I can see Kate putting the answers in there. Well done, folks. Okay. Here's the cruel picture number one. Top left is the elder. That's the elder. What about top right? Anybody got this one? Kate says lime. No. Uh, not the lime, not a hornbeam. White bean, Mark. Well done. And Nick. Well done. Yeah, and Valerie. White bean. That's the white bean. Okay, good stuff. We haven't talked about that tonight. So uh, there you go. The next one. Bottom left. What have we got there, folks? Anybody got that one? Very distinctive flower, that one. A ring of large flowers, with, um, which encase smaller flowers. Mark has put Gelder Rose. Mark would be correct. This is the Gelder Rose. Small shrubby tree. Uh, bright red berries um, in autumn. Bottom left, so bottom right is Rowan. That's the Rowan, which is related to the white bean. There you go. This one, folks, what do we got here? George has put pine. It is a pine. It's actually a Scots pine. It's our native pine. But, you know, I accept pine. They look very similar. Kate, Kate's put needles and twins. Yeah, needles in pairs. If it's a pear, it's a pine. But not all pines are pears as my teacher Dave Watson says. So um, it's a Scots pine, this one. You can see the needles in pairs below. That's the Scots pine flower. To be fair, we didn't talk about that one tonight. This one here, this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a, um, a killer, this one. Antonia says, you, question mark? Mark's got it right again. This is juniper. This is the juniper tree, smells of gin. Uh, it's where they get the flavoring for gin from, from the berries. This is juniper. We know it for the berries and for its spiky leaves. But actually, it's got these tiny little flowers as well in spring. And I think this is the last one. This is the U. Well done, folks. This is the U. So I've done our three native conifers there as well. Um, it has to be U. It is because it's the only native one that I've not covered of our conifers. So that's the male U tree. Look for it in churchyards. OK, folks, that is the quiz done. Have a look at your scores. We don't, we're not going to share our scores. It's not the competition, uh, but just good to know what uh how you did and hopefully there's some good learning points for you there as well right folks now um we're already running over a little bit but i'm gonna i've just got a little bit more for you guys as well i hope you'll stay with me now if uh book recommendations we haven't got time unfortunately we've run out of time but you can email me if you want some book recommendations folks if you want to really know your trees if you really enjoyed this tonight you want to take it further i've got some courses um, so FSA have been kind enough to let me just uh, plug for a couple of minutes about some courses that I've got. They're online courses. Of course, I teach outdoors too. But with the online stuff, we can reach everybody and you get some references there. I've got a course. Oh, it's not a Black Friday bundle. That's wrong. But uh, it's the same offer. Um, <laughs> we've got a course. It's called the Complete Tree ID course. All the pictures you've seen tonight are from that for the most part. And there's loads of resources on there. Basically, the course will take you from clueless to confident on your journey to being a tree expert. If you on the course and you've enjoyed it, 
do let people know in the chat room. It'd be good to know that there's real people on the course. And it's not just me uh, saying it's any good. So that's always good to know. Uh, there's a whole course there. Basically, there are videos on there and videos of me going out in the woods at all times of the year, braving the snow, the wind and the rain, showing you all these details. You can look at, you know, uh, Hornbeam in autumn and have a look what's going on with the uh, with the of the nuts there. You can go to Sweet Chestnut in winter and see what the twigs are looking at and look at them all. Um, lots of resources on there, loads of videos for you to check out. There are cheat sheets as well, cheat sheets like this, which you can kind of print out and use with your groups, or you can download them to your phone and use them as learning resources. There's a cheat sheet for every tree on the course in all four seasons. So you can print off field maple in summer and just look at the key four key things you need to look at to ID the tree. So they're all there as resources, loads of PDFs that you can use and use with your groups. There are photos, there are hundreds of photos of the trees at all four times of the year as well. So again, you can get all these details, the stuff that often field guides don't show you everything. This gives you even more detail. There are photos in studio. So I've isolated everything as well. You can see winter, autumn, spring, summer signs there of all trees. And you can really see it on a clear background and really see what you're looking for each time of the year, including just leaf litter in the winter. So that's the white poplar in the middle there, showing you what the leaf litter looks like, something distinctive to look out for. There's a Facebook group as well, private group, where people ask questions, share pictures and um, post questions for me about what they see. And I put little videos on about what I see too. Private group, you can join and uh, meet other people who are keen on trees. And yeah, so there's basically up to 45 native and common trees in all four seasons on the course. You get live student only workshops. So we do workshops like this four times a year, just for students. Um, you get cheat sheets with, uh, you can view on your phone or print them out. You can get one-to-one -one coaching with me online as well. That's an option. Uh, you get a Facebook group. And if you wanna just check it out and take a punt, there's a 30 day money back guarantee if you decide it's not for you. And for everybody on the webinar tonight and watching the recording, I'm doing 20% off for everybody, but only for eight days. Um, so if you want to check that out, um, I'm going to share the link very soon. Um, and it's 20% off using the code spring FSA. And if I just um, stop the share for a minute and I just get that up, I will get you guys the code now, which is here. Um, there it is. Bang. Let's go back onto here. Let's go back onto Zoom. I'll get the code now, folks. Sharing screen. Here we go slideshow. There it is. Bring that up now. So if you're interested in checking that out, have a little look on here. And I think the FSA are actually going to email out the link as well. But there's some links there, folks, as well as the link to the spring tree guide. But wait, there's more. If you want to just try before you buy, there's a free version of the course called Kickstart Your Tree ID Skills. Um, I expect some people in the room are probably on that, which is great. So it's a free version of the course, which just has three tree species, which shows you what the course is like. Um, and you can go through them in all four seasons and see what it's all about. So check it out. Um, there's an example of what's in the free course, cheat sheets, photo galleries, videos, hazel, ash, and field maple are featured on that course. So do check that out. That link is in the chat as well, folks. If you can't find the links, whatever reason, you can email me at Woodland Classroom check it out. Um, I've just put the link to the tree guide as well. That's it. I think that's everything. Um, questions. We'll see if we've got time to hang on. Just briefly as well, we do online workshops. We do foraging workshops online and we've got John Wright, River Cottage Forager, coming in a couple of weeks. If you want to check that out, it's on the website. But that's probably enough plugging for now, folks. I'm going to stop my sharing and um, make sure we all get away in good time. Um, Matt, how are we getting on? Yeah, we've got time for some questions. If uh, if people like, just before anyone else jumps off and we um we we miss out on our, our chance to, to plug, I forgot to mention and was uh, rightly told off by by Nick that you need to save the date for the FSA conference, which is uh, the last day of September and the first two days of October. Um, and uh, yes, there will be at some point there will be a, a link to to the booking when that opens. So watch out for that and we'll keep plugging that. But for the moment, save that date in your diary. Good, good. Sounds good to me. So there's some links in the chat there, folks. I'm happy to stay on for uh, five minutes and answer any questions that people have about spring trees. Um, fire away if you have any. For those of you who have to go, thank you for sharing, uh, for coming and, and uh, giving us your time for an hour. I hope you've learned something and I hope it's inspired you.
And uh, do look out for those tiny flowers. There's some lovely details out there. If you have a question, pop it in the chat. Lots of people saying thank you. That's lovely to hear. Thanks very much. Maybe I'll be back again for summer. Who knows? I think the webinar calendar is already full, actually. So <laughs> it is. It is up to December, but there's always Fair next. Enough. Year. So um, so we'll uh, we'll be be booking you in for next year for summer. Lovely. That'd be fantastic. And and maybe winter as well. You know. Yeah. Right back uh, autumn even. You've done the winter one. Yeah. Nick says, what's the tree you look for most in the spring? Mine is birch. I think for me, the arrival of spring to me is the flush of hawthorn. It's the green hawthorn is that vibrant green, which just says, oh, I didn't realise how bored I was of looking at grey and brown for the last couple of months. Suddenly green flushes everywhere en masse. So I, like, I really look forward to that with the hawthorn. Just It's a, it's a lovely, vibrant, fresh spring green when the whole form first comes out so it's very welcome because it makes me kind of go ah spring's coming and then we get a load of snow like, <laughs> like it kind of happened this year but yeah yeah nice kate says hawthorn is called bread and cheese here children used to eat the first leaves yeah don't know why it's bread and cheese it doesn't taste anything like it unfortunately it's a bit of a letdown you can put the leaves in a cheese sandwich though that'd be nice same with bread Um, Julie's asking about resources for southern Spain. Many of the trees are the same. Anything you can do? I'm not sure, Julia. Um, I mean, certainly um, things will translate easily online, you would hope. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, the seasons are going to be different in Spain to when things come out in terms of the spring tree calendar. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Um, it's worth just getting field guides locally and then cross-referencing with a, um, a UK field guide with the Latin names. And then, you know, you're looking at the same thing and you could always kind of type in the text from the Spanish field guide and see what they're saying about it over there in terms of its season and, and cheat a little bit that way and, and pull out the information. Unless you speak Spanish, in which case it'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> so how are you telling the difference between the two native oaks? That's a good one, Mark. Um, it's difficult to tell right now. But um, in summer and autumn, it's easier to tell. Basically, there is a sessile oak and the peduncular oak. I went blank for a second there. Sessile oak tends to like northern uplands and west of Britain more. Um, the peduncular oak tends to like kind of southern and central Britain more, although they're kind of, we see English oak near us as well. So it's planted all over because it's the classic oak tree. So peduncular oak has peduncles which are the stalks. The acorns are on stalks with the pedunculate or English oak. They grow on stalks. The sessile oak is sessile. It doesn't have stalks. The acorns grow right on the twig, okay? With the leaves, it's the other way around. The, um, the English or pedunculate oak, the leaves don't have any stalks or very short stalks. Whereas with the sessile oak, the leaves have stalks. So it's the opposite way around with the leaves. So summer and autumn is the best time to notice the difference between them, I would say. That's what you're looking out for. Okay. I think we've taken enough of people's times up. If you're happy, that's cool. Thanks for all the lovely kind words, though, folks. It's been really nice to do this. And if you've got questions about trees, drop me a line and check out the free course as well. Thank you very much, James, for your time this evening. And thank you, everyone else, for uh, turning up.